Uh, so I think we talked about cosmological principle and that's where we ended with. So um, I, I think uh, I did show some of the um, kind of things that relate to activity in galactic core. So I think I do remember playing this video and kind of illustrating our galaxy's core as a quiet place. There are stars orbiting the supermassive black hole and other than that, nothing else is happening, quiet, easy to simulate. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, but we think it may have been active in the past. So an um, example of uh, galaxies with an active nucleus, uh, active or um, where there are matter falling into a supermassive black hole and that's emitting light. Uh, quasars are, or quasars are examples of that. And um, our model of quasar is that it's, um, um, it, when they're super, dis super far away, they're moving at speed close to uh, speed of light uh, away from us. And our model, of how quasars produce all that energy in such a small space is that it's a supermassive black hole that has material around it that's falling into it. And as th these things are falling in, um, it releases a lot of energy. And, um, and we think uh, uh, there's some evidence that the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy might have been active in the past. So this is a reconstructed map that illustrates the observed X-ray and gamma ray emissions in these regions uh, perpendicular from the uh, plane of the galaxy. And one of the ways these could be produced is if there was a matter falling into our supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, and that was producing the jets that we have seen coming from quasars. And um, this could be the leftover group, um, the high energy particles that's uh, producing this. Um, so, uh, so I think we kind of touched on that. So the only thing that I don't think I um, spent uh, sufficient time on is something that connects to what we'll look at in module six. And uh, it's uh, Hubble's discovery. So we talked about Hubble's other discovery of Andromeda being another galaxy. And that's an important discovery, but that's not what is most uh, known for. Uh, what is most known for is his discovery that um, uses the, the uh, same thing that he was using to discover that Andromeda is a galaxy. He, it's uh, based on his observation of Cepheid variable stars. So he you know, had a great success um, measuring distance to Andromeda galaxies. So he um, continued to study other nearby, uh, well, other nebulas that are similar to Andromeda galaxies. So, you know, they could be another galaxy. So he would identify Cepheid the variable stars within those uh, galaxies and, um, and measure their properties. And as he was doing that, he discovered a remarkable relationship. So, so when, when he measures, uh, observes a galaxy, there are uh, two things that, um, there are two things that he's measuring. One is the distance. That's uh, kind of the main thing that his work is involved in. He's measuring, um, he's finding cepheid variable stars and using them to estimate the distance. That's one. And there's a second thing that's actually a lot easier to measure than the distance you can measure radial velocity, how fast something is moving toward us or moving away from us. We can measure that directly from a spectrum. Once you get a spectrum of anything, spectrum of a star, galaxy, and it has enough of those absorption lines to be able to identify a particular fingerprints of the elements, then using Doppler shift, which was discussed earlier in connection with the quasar. <laughs> it's actually part of chapter five. We could have talked about it then, but I decided to move it to this portion of the class because this is where it's actually super relevant. So, um, so Doppler shift is a shift of the wavelength and frequency that occurs when the source of the wave moves. 
And um, here's a kind of a quick demonstration of that with the sound wave. It's fun, listen to it, I want. <laughs> and um, and what is important here is that when you see those wavelengths of shift, that in our in the observed spectrum that immediately tells us how fast something is moving either away from us or toward us. There's a second kind of motion called proper motion. That's where things are moving perpendicular to the line connecting them and us. And that's not in the, that doesn't usually show up in Doppler shift. But what does show up on Doppler shift is um, the radial motion. And um, so yeah, so in yeah, and, and this is also used to measure velocities of uh, star clusters in Milky Way galaxy. Um, so using the Doppler shift, he, as he was observed measuring properties of these distant galaxies, he could uh, uh, measure their velocity alongside the distance that he was also estimating using Cepheid variable stars. And when he was um, analyzing those, this is the relationship that he recognized. So if uh, he's limiting himself to the nearby galaxies, I think these are the nearby dwarf galaxies. Um, these are probably the Andromeda galaxy local group, um, about 2 million light years away. And as you look at more distant galaxy, there is a pattern. So nearby, the galaxies are their space are all over the place. Some are moving away, some are moving closer. That kind of makes sense. Um, some of those dwarf galaxies are orbiting Milky Way. Some of them are in the process of colliding. Um, but as you look at galaxies that are 6 million light years away, uh, there's none that's moving toward us. There's none that's even at rest relative to us. They are, they are mostly moving away. And this is a pattern that holds uh, as you measure more and more galaxies. It, uh, this is kind of how a <laughs> study in science is done. You have some, um, you do some exploratory study that indicates some kind of trend or something interesting that's happening. And you do a follow-up study that involves more data or more, harder to collect the data because when the galaxies are this far away, that uh, one makes them much fainter. So uh, during Hubble's time, there wasn't Hubble telescope, ironically enough, <laughs> or maybe not ironic. So, um, so, so more distant galaxies would have been harder to measure because they are fainter. And um, there are limitations of ground-borne telescopes. Um, so, so that's one. And the method of using Cepheid variable stars, um, it, they kind of rely on the, the star being bright enough. And I think at about 100 million light years away is at the limit of the method. So, so this is the, as much as uh, he could do using just the Cepheid variable stars. And um, so this is the, the follow-up study where he's um, gathering more data as much as he could. And that relationship continues to hold. And it's quite remarkable because at this distance away and at these speeds, these are beginning to approach speed of light, I think. Speed of light is, uh, let me try to remember, 300,000 uh, kilometers per second. So this is not quite speed of light, but it's uh, beginning to approach it. It's at, um, it's at, something less than 10%, but, um, and compared to the relative velocities of galaxies here, you do have to look at this and say, um, either there's something here, some common cause that's uh, uh, causing these uh, far away galaxies to move faster and faster away from us. That's one possibility or two, <laughs> it could be an experimental error. And uh, what we have um, uh, found since then using uh, better methods using type 1a stars, type 1a supernovas to estimate distances. Um, it's, it's not an observational error. It, it is a consistent relationship. And, um, and the common thing that's driving it, it's encapsulated in what we call Hubble's law. 
it's uh, you could describe this as a, what we call phenomenological law, meaning a law that uh, describes a phenomenon that's occurring without necessarily giving an explanation why it might be occurring. So this is Hubble's law. It says that there's a linear relationship between a receding velocity of a faraway galaxies and their distance away from us. It's a linear. And this H is what's called the Hubble's constant. It's the, that's the slope of this graph. Um, and um, uh, so, so it's, a, um, it's quite remarkable relationship. There's a, um, let me just, <laughs> and, and uh, these slides are titled expanding universe because that is the, that is the, that is the thing, hypothesis, that would explain Hubble's law. If we live in an expanding universe, then that would explain why uh, we would observe something like this. And that's uh, more properly related to the cosmology. So um, we will um, end this thread in module six. So I'll leave that there. But I want you to uh, point this out because the first discovery of Hubble's law is, was in um, observation of distant, uh, distant galaxies. And uh, this ties into general relativity and cosmology. Uh, this is tied into something that Einstein was quoted as calling his greatest blunder, um, something called the cosmological constant. And we'll talk about that in module six. So that, that's next week. Um, <laughs> for today, I will wrap it up here.